Good morning. Happy Thursday, everyone. Praise God. Once again, he's been faithful to us and blessed us with another opportunity to walk this earth in relationship with him and be blessed by the love and the care that he shows for us, his creation. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this morning declaring that you are our God, our Lord, you are all that we need. And your son, Jesus Christ, repaired the relationship we had with you and reconciled us to you through the shedding of his precious, innocent blood. We thank you, Father, for Jesus, and we pray that your Holy Spirit leads and guides us into a relationship with you where we resemble your son, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Continuing lesson four of the summer quarter, our daily devotion today is titled Samaritan Community Changed from the book of John, chapter four, verses nine through 19 and 39 to 42. John 4, 9 says, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, Ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who is it that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and we, he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, Thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? <clears throat> Jesus answered and said to her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up unto everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband, Jesus. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that saith thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And then we go to verse 39. <clears throat> and it says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And saith unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee. <clears throat> so because Jesus um, told this woman all about herself uh, she perceived that he was a prophet and when the people that she went back and told came and talked to him he spoke to them and they perceived that he was the Christ God will reveal himself to you <clears throat> if you allow him. 
All right, continuing this week's lesson, um, we're in section 1C, lifting up the resurrected one. Book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 29 through 34. I'm going to start in verse 32. It says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit, certain men clave unto him and believed, um, among the which was Dysorius the Agrippite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. <clears throat> the commentary says to repent in verse 30 means to change one's direction or to turn around. The revelation of Jesus Christ through preaching is God's clear message to sinful people to turn from idolatry and find the one true God. The reason for this call to repentance is that God has a day of judgment when all will be judged by the righteousness of Christ. That's verse 31. The reality of this judgment and the reality of divine salvation are confirmed by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The Athenians were able to relate, at least intellectually, to Paul's discourse until he mentioned the resurrection. At this, some began to mock Paul, verse 32. In order to understand this mocking, we need to be aware that Platonic philosophy had influenced Greek thought to the extent that the Greeks thought of man as having a dual nature, soul and body. The main goal was to reunite the soul with the divine soul of the universe. The body was of little consequence. To even suggest there was a resurrection of the body was pure folly to the Greeks. The body was a prison which kept the soul from gaining the real freedom it desired and needed. Paul understood the bodily resurrection, resurrection was a crucial element in God's plan of redemption. <clears throat> if the body was not going to be redeemed, then Satan had conquered at least part of God's creation. Thus, the plan of redemption includes the making of the new incorruptible body at the resurrection of the righteous. <clears throat> While some indeed mock this Jewish and Christian view, others found it of value and wanted to hear more of Paul's teaching. Paul left the hill and remained but a short time longer in Athens. While there is no mention of a church in Athens, there were several people who came to believe the gospel. Two of them are mentioned by name. Dionysus was a member of the Agropacus and had heard Paul argue the gospel. A woman named Demarius is also mentioned. We know very little about these two people. The narrative closes with Paul leaving Athens and going to Corinth. <coughs> See Acts chapter 18, verse 1. All right, section 2, Radical Signs of Repentance. Miraculous Works, Acts chapter 19, verse 11 through 16. And God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. The commentary says, Acts 19 narrates the ministry of Paul in Ephesus, which was the principal city on the trade routes to the east from Rome. It was the capital of the province of Asia and was a free Greek city. The culture of the goddess Artemis was located the cult of the goddess Artemis was located in Ephesus. The temple 
to this pagan goddess was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Paul's ministry began with leading 12 men into water baptism, which culminated by their receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit. See verses 1 through 7. Paul then preached concerning the kingdom in the local synagogue for three months and then moved to a lecture hall where he taught for two years. In Romans 15 verses 18 through 19 and 2 Corinthians verse 12 of chapter 12, Paul wrote that the Lord blessed him with wonders and miracles. He called them signs of an apostle. The two Corinthian letters were written from Ephesus. So Paul had in mind some of the things that are related <clears throat> in Acts 19. Verse 12 describes healings that remind us of healings in the Gospels of those who touched the fringe of Jesus' cloak in Mark chapter 5. Uh, verse 27 and Mark 6, 56. The handkerchiefs and aprons were items Paul used and wore while he worked as a craftsman. Luke pictured a man of God who took the heat of the day to preach the gospel, the only time he could get the hall, and whose menial work for his livelihood God used to perform special miracles. People were healed, and demons were cast out by items left with his secular work. Verse 13 of the text indicates several Jewish exorcists were attempting to cast out demons in the name of Jesus and Paul. However, the name of Jesus, which is above every other name, see Philippians 2.9, is not a magic formula. His name is is not an object we can use to accomplish our own desires. Rather, his name is the reality of the power of God in and through our lives. The power of God that exercises dominion and lordship over our lives. And that's what we should be praying for. In verse 14 of the text, Luke describes what happened to seven brothers who tried this new method, but the demon took issue with them and indicated his power over them. The demon knew Jesus, the Son of God, and he knew Paul, the servant of God. But these seven were charlatans who were in worse condition than the demon. They did not know who Jesus was. The demon attacked the brothers, beat them, and stripped them of their clothes. The impact of this event was powerful. The name of Jesus was glorified among the Jews and Greeks of Ephesus. <clears throat> Verse 16 and 17. Okay, 2B, transform lives. Acts 19, verse 17 through 22. And it says, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. <clears throat> Commentary says the Christian witness in Ephesus was enhanced because of what happened to the sons of Sceva. The fear, from verse 17, refers to the humbling of people in the awe of the Lord. This was not a paralyzing fear Rather, it was the humbling experience of the re revelation of God's power. Such a revelation from God always destroys our facades of strength 
and power. Repentant Ephesians brought their books that dealt with magic and witchcraft and burned them in public. This is a powerful term of testimony for their occultic practices were considered by most, most Ephesians to be acceptable, normal lifestyles. Also, the materials they destroyed were worth perhaps millions of dollars. So the word of the Lord concerning eternal salvation through faith in Jesus Christ was growing greatly and prevailing. <clears throat> it's an insert here titled, What If? What would happen if believers demonstrated outside of their worship sanctuaries what is being professed inside? Not what signs which are the common means of protest, but with words backed up by a, and demonstrated by lifestyles. And that's written by Gerald J. Daffy. So what he's saying that what if people demonstrated the love of God and who God is by their deeds, by their works, by their commitment to following Christ, how would that change how the world views Jesus and how they're being called into uh, the faith? That would be a greater work because actions speak louder than words. Thank you for your time this morning. I pray that your day is blessed by the love of God and that he shows himself to you and reveals how much he cares for you this day.